Good evening and welcome to each of you. It is great to see this room filling up and it's great to feel the collective energy as a whole um, when we're here together tonight. I'm Shelley Biting, the Executive Director of the Columbus Women's Commission in the office of Mayor Gunther. And first tonight, we want to thank Columbus State. Um, they're hosting us this evening, but also for their steadfast efforts here in our community. The way their leadership team and professors listen to their students, the way they're creating access through a hub for healthy foods, the way they've created Mitchell Hall as a career pipeline for individuals in our community, it's endless what they're doing as they're listening to students and the residents here in Columbus and meeting their needs. They model bold leadership. So we thank them for their work in the community, for your efforts, and for hosting us here this evening. Um, and with that, I have the honor to introduce the president, Dr. David Harrison. Thank you, Shelley. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, it's uh, a big deal for us to be able to host this. Uh, these kinds of conversations are incredibly important to the college, and we try to try to emulate that as much as we can. Please make yourselves at home. Uh, as I tell our students, walk in like you own the place, because you do. Um, uh, anything you need, let us know. Um, do want to take a minute to uh, extend my personal thanks to uh, Mayor Ginther and to um, First Lady Shannon Ginther uh, for taking on um, this incredibly important cause. Um, Columbus State was proud to be an early signer uh, to the Columbus commitment. And it's important to us both as an employer but also uh, for the work we do with our students. 54% uh, of our students uh, are women. Uh, many of them are working, uh, many of them are working 20 or more hours, uh, juggling family responsibilities um, with their work schedule and their class schedule. They're heroic in so many ways, and anything we can do, certainly as a college, but as a community, uh, to help them meet their goals is what we are trying to do. So uh, we're happy to be part of the fight uh, and pleased to uh, be partners in this process. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, thank you very much. The Columbus Women's Commission works to advance the economic well-being of women in our community. We use data to get to the root causes of issues that limit women's opportunities. And with the support of Mayor Ginther's office and our community partners, focus in four key areas. Pay equity, housing and evictions, health, and workforce development. The issues the commission is addressing are real. One in four women in central Ohio lacks basic economic security. Columbus women working full time make 78 cents for every dollar a man earns and over 52,000 households in Columbus are single female headed. And for the women in those households, the poverty rate is more than six times higher. We believe all women should have the opportunity to succeed. Our commissioners are passionate experts with diverse backgrounds, digging deep to understand the issues that limit women's opportunities and are focused on creating change. We are a convener of community conversations and making big change happen quickly. We engage with Columbus residents to elevate women's issues. We believe in the women in our community and in the power of their stories. We know that together, we can make bold things happen. We are the Columbus Women's Commission. So thank you again to each of you for coming out this evening to join in the conversation and more importantly, to learn from one another. So one of our roles as a commission is to understand the needs facing women and families in our community. And we do this by looking at data and also listening to experiences. We recognize that bringing together a group of people with diverse perspectives, life and professional backgrounds, it's critical for us to step into a stage of problem solving. So thank you for being a part of the conversation this evening. And here's a brief walkthrough of what we'll be doing tonight. Um, so first, we'll hear from First Lady Shannon Ginther, the chair of the Columbus Women's Commission. And then we'll hear from four commissioners to share about the work of the commission, what we've learned, 
the data that has guided our work, our progress, as well as where we see opportunities to advance policy and advocacy here in our community. After that, we will transition to the hearing of your voices. Uh, when I looked at the definition of town hall, I learned it is a way to meet with the community, to both hear from them on topics of interest and to answer questions. So we're building both of those elements into the program design this evening. So we'll have about 30 minutes of table conversations where a commissioner or a staff member from the mayor's office is seated with you. And then we'll hear your feedback and join in a conversation on these areas um, that we're focusing on tonight. Then after that, we'll have about 20 minutes of question and answer. So be sure to be thinking about questions you have for us um, as the Women's Commission as we're building this work here in the community. So we do have a robust agenda to get us through the next 90 minutes. So thank you for being with us tonight in this space. Um, and it's now my honor to introduce the individual who four years ago had the vision for this work, who is laser focused, and who is unwavering in her commitment to women and families in the community. First Lady, Shannon Gether. Good evening. And thank you again for being part of the conversation this evening. When my husband, I get to call him Andy, was elected to his first term in 2016, I had the opportunity to put my efforts behind this community and I knew exactly what I wanted to focus on. Advancing the economic well-being of Columbus's women. I believe in the power of women's stories. I believe in passionately seeking answers, and I believe in the women of Columbus. Having worked in health and healthcare administration for most of my career, I have a great understanding of some of the issues that women face. Working toward this goal, in early 2017, the mayor and I launched the Columbus Women's Commission. We currently have 25 appointed commissioners serving two-year terms. I would like to publicly recognize and thank the commissioners for their efforts and to identify, or I'm sorry, um, and in, in their service on the Women's Commission. Would you all please stand for a round of applause if you're part of the commission? The Commission has convened conversations to build on our existing work in, com in the community and to identify where the Commission is uniquely positioned to create change. We have held mel multiple community outreach meetings and focus groups and uncovered layers of data. The issues the Commission is addressing are real. As referenced in the video, one in four women in Central Ohio lacks basic economic security. We also know that 38% of women earn less than $15 an hour in the Columbus metropolitan area. So to impact women's economic position, the charge of the commission is focused on four key areas facing women in our community. Gender equity in the workplace, housing, workforce development and career pipelines, and health. You will hear from our committee chairs about our work in each of those specific areas, the data that has grounded us and our approach to each area. My hope for this work and for this community is that we can better understand the root causes of issues that limit women's opportunities and economic mobility, that we bring people together from diverse perspectives to work with one another on these challenging issues that we increase awareness and influence policy that will change women's experiences here in our community. We believe that together we can make bold things happen. We believe diversity is mighty. We believe in the women of Columbus. I now have the pleasure to welcome Commissioner Barb Smoot to the podium. Thank you, First Lady Ginther. I am here tonight as Chair of the Equity and the Workplace Committee. My day job is President and CEO of Women for Economic and Leadership Development, WELD for short. 
I raise my hand to be a part of this work because the economic health and prosperity of a community are inextricably tied to the well-being and financial security of women. There is no rational reason that can justify having women and families live in poverty and, and live with less simply due to unexplained pay disparity. With a focus on improving women's economic lives, one of the policy areas that rose to the top of the Commission's radar early on was gender and race-based pay equity. This drove the early establishment of the Pay Equity Committee. We learned women in Columbus earn 78 cents for, for the, every dollar earned by a white man. That is below the national st statistic of 80 cents on the dollar. For women of color, I am sad to say, the disparities are even worse. 63 cents for African American women and 54 cents for Latina women. Rece recent research commissioned by the Women's Fund of Central Ohio shows even more disparity. When we look at the wealth gap by gender, we learn that single women in the US own 40 cents to every dollar a white man owns. For a woman of color, of course, the disparities are even worse. Latino women own four cents, four pennies. African American women only two cents, two pennies. In Columbus, which was named America's Opportunity City, we cannot let this be normal. The pay gap is real. When considering the pay losses over a lifetime, the economic impact for women and families is staggering. Over the course of a year, women's total earnings loss compared with men are 700,000 for a high school graduate, 1.2 million for a college graduate, and 2 million for a professional school graduate. We knew something had to happen to make bold change in this community on this issue. That is why in 2017 the Columbus Women's Commission launched the Columbus Commitment Achieving Pay Equity. The Columbus Commitment is a voluntary employer-led pledge to address the gender and race-based wage gap. Today we are absolutely thrilled to share that over 260 employers in our community that have signed the pledge and are committed to addressing workplace inequities already just two years after its launch. The level of engagement and willingness to learn, analyze, and change their company's policies and practices to support gender equity in Columbus's workplaces is nothing short of spectacular. The commitment asks employers to learn about the gender pay gap, understand how race and other factors and even create even larger disparities, analyze and review internal policies, and take action to build awareness around the unique challenges facing women in the workplace. We strive to create an open space for the adopting companies to learn about the impact of gender and race-based inequities, and we do this by hosting quarterly learning events and an annual half-day session in the spring for adopting companies to share best practices and learn from each other. And the commitment goes beyond the numbers, just the numbers of equal pay for equal work, which are all still vitally important, but it's also where are women in the company and ensuring opportunity to succeed. As we continued our work, we began to understand that in addition to addressing pay inequities, we need to also look at gender and racial equity holistically and begin conversations about the role organizations have in addressing these inequities. We have evolved the work of the committee to look beyond pay equity and at gender equity in the workplace, exploring how other policies and practices create inequities that often lead to the wage gap. Our focus now is to sustain and grow the initiative and ensure we are providing our adopters with the inspiration tools and resources to implement best practices, such as removing salary history from applications. We launched our first ever anonymous adopter survey in the fall of 2019 to hear from commitment adopters what policies and practices they have implemented, but also which areas they could use additional resources and support from us to move the needle. Here's some of what we learned. 64% of the adopters completed the survey. Of those who completed it, over half offer paid family leave for all employees. 22.6% of those survey respondents implemented this after signing the commitment. Half no longer include past salary in the hiring process. Of those 50%, about 42% of those survey respondents implemented this after the signing. 39.7% offer bias training to make hiring promotions and pay decisions or employee evaluations. 
and over half have conducted a company-wide pay equity review pay analysis. We also learned in what areas our adopters needed more support. The numbers are about roughly a third for all of these categories. They want help implementing strategic diversity goals, help uplifting women of color, want help understanding and addressing implicit bias. The survey respondents have been instrumental in informing how we will offer resources to best support our adopters going forward. We know there is no one-size-fits-all solution to this issue. There are many ways to impact the gender and race-based wage gap. In terms of growth, we are actively doing outreach to grow the number of Central Ohio employers who have adopted the commitment. There are materials, including the commitment form itself, for every single one of you here today. Know that these are also available online and for the download, and you can download these at the Columbus Women's Commission website too. Every one of you can help in, in several ways. You know, if your company has signed the commitment, begin to ask what changes they've implemented. If your company has not signed, advocate for your employer to sign the commitment. As individuals, it's up to us to start the conversation and educate work on workforce inequities. We can all help by implementing positive changes in our, work, our own work environment. We know 100% pay equity is a fuel that will make our community thrive and are excited to continue and expand this work. Another new piece of new and emerging work in 2020 is around financial empowerment of our residents. And in 2019, we were one of seven cities around the nation that were awarded a competitive grant to address financial empowerment in our city. Our grant submitted by partnership in partnership with Council Pr President Pro Tempore Elizabeth Brown has a clear focus on women and families. And we are currently gathering the data and getting support from city leadership from this. We look forward to sharing the final plan with everyone later this year. And now, it gives me absolute great pleasure to announce our fellow commissioner, Jillian Ollinger, to the platform. Thank you. Good evening. It's an honor to be here tonight in my role as commissioner and chair of the Housing and Evictions Committee. I also serve as chief mission officer with YWCA Columbus, where our mission is to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I am passionate about this work because day in and day out at YWCA's Family Emergency Shelter, we see what happens when families run out of options. And this lack of options is disproportionately borne by women and people of color in our community. From the 2016 Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority study, we know that in our community, 95% of homeless families are headed by women, 71% are African American, with an average of two children, whom are the majority under seven years of age. While not all evictions lead to homelessness, most homeless women and families have an eviction. And that is why what the Commission and our partners have been able to achieve in just these last few years gives me such great hope for the work that still remains in this space. The topic of housing is a critical one in our community. And we knew from the start that housing was an area that we wanted to better understand and in particular to explore how we could play a part in raising awareness of the eviction crisis in our community and to support policy change in that realm. So what do we know about eviction activity in Franklin County? We know we have one of the highest rates of filings in the state. In 2018, we had close to 18,000 evictions filed. We know that there is a geographic component to evictions. This map shows the occurrences of eviction filings in 2016, and the dark red being the highest number of occurrences. In this heat map, you can see that of the 54 zip codes in Franklin County, 41% of all filed evictions are coming from only six zip codes. The areas of Hilltop in the west, Whitehall and Blacklick in the east, and Northland in the north are the highest. We also know that evictions signal significant household financial insecurity. According to the Urban Institute, over 57% of Columbus families have less than $2,000 in savings. After an income disruption, these families are 14 times more likely to be evicted. And finally, we know we must focus on preventing evictions from happening in the first place. An eviction or displacement from a residence can have many short and long-term consequences 
that reverberate long after new housing is found, including damaged credit, loss of property due to curbside setouts, loss of Section 8 housing, loss of employment or missed work, and educational disruption for children. This is a dire picture I just painted for you, but we are making progress. This past year alone, our community accomplished the following. City Council strengthened city code to prosecute retaliatory evictions and support tenants' rights to occupy safe housing. The eviction prevention program was launched to assist women and families with emergency financial and legal support for housing stability and homelessness prevention. The Franklin County Municipal Court Self-Help Resource Center was relocated to make it more accessible for residents needing services. This past year, the commission also held monthly working meetings with leadership from the municipal court and clerk of court's office. As a result of this work, we are already seeing policy changes that will impact our residents. In August, we proposed six policy recommendations to the court and five were endorsed. As of January 15th, municipal clerk Tyex website no longer displays eviction records that are older than three years from case closure. Nearly 400,000 prior eviction cases were removed from online access. With some cases, yeah. With some cases dating as far back as the early 1990s. This change helps to remove a major systemic barrier for residents in finding safe, stable housing. And this is just the beginning. The Commission will continue to work with our housing partners and court leadership. We are thoughtfully considering a number of strategies focused on bringing equity to the process and ensuring that tenants facing eviction have the tools and resources they need to be able to continue to provide for themselves and their families. We see a clear intersection between the Commission's mission to dismantle barriers and reduce gender-based inequities to improve the economic position of all women in our community and the ongoing displacement that threatens to destabilize vulnerable members of our community. And I would now like to invite Commissioner Ronnie Marquez Posey to the podium. Thank you, Jillian. Good evening. Good evening. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. My name is Ronnie Marquez Posey, and I'm here tonight representing the commission. I am a commissioner and a chair of the Workforce Development and Career Pipelines Committees. I raised my hand to be a part of this commission and a part of this work because I believe that the work of the commission and what they do today will extend outward into our future. And they will create a major impact. So what do I say when I say future? What do I mean? Future, that means hopefully in my lifetime, the gender inequality and the wage gap will no longer exist. Hopefully in my lifetime, I'll be able to see that people are compensated for the work that they do, for what they have in here and their dedicated work effort, as opposed to what they have, you know, elsewhere. <laughs> um, so, their gender. So when the commission determined workforce as an area of focus, we also started looking at the data. As mentioned in the video, there are over 52,000 households in Columbus that are female-headed with no spouse in the home. In central Ohio, the poverty rate is more than six times higher for women in female-headed households. The poverty rate for female-headed households with children under the age of five is at 51%. Nationally, 42% of women with children under the age of 18 are the sole or primary breadwinners for their family. When looking at those in workforce, almost two-thirds of mothers with children under the age of six are working outside the home. So these aren't just issues that affect women. These are issues that affect families. And so then, of course, it affects communities. So when looking at, at 
these barriers that women face. Barriers face, women face barriers to economic security and, and, and they're significant, including limited access to jobs that pay a livable wage, inequitable workplace policies such as sick days and leave and paid family leave. As Barb shared earlier in her comments, more employers are making positive strides in changing their workplace policies. We commend employers for their commitment to this work. This past year, we saw more local employers pay $15 an hour minimum wage for full-time employers, uh, employees. And we commend the city of Columbus because they are leading by example. Our committee's work in 2019 led us to explore career opportunities in Central Ohio that offer livable and equitable wages. Specifically, our journey has led us to building awareness of opportunities in the skilled trades, where there are viable career opportunities and pay equity in the workplace for women. We held a skills trade outreach event in 2019, standing room. It was, it was, it was a, an awesome event. Uh, we will be hosting another Women in Trades event in May of this year. So follow us on social media. On, and uh, actually, uh, also go to our website. It'll be held on the 19th of May. Hope to see you there. An opportunity for women and girls to get hands-on experience and talk with the women that are currently working in these fields, in these trades. We know that exposure to the trades is a key element in girls seeing their potential as a carpenter or an electrician. Our work has also led us to building a partnership with Chicago Women in Trades, a national nonprofit that's working to expand opportunities for women in the trades. In 2020, we will continue to explore where the commission is positioned to make the greatest impact we will continue to work with partners to elevate these conversations and create learning opportunities so that more women can see themselves in these careers. We also know there's a relationship between childcare, transportation, and workforce. In focus groups with women, we've learned the high cost of childcare, weighing the cost of childcare against the paycheck that they bring home, accessing quality child care, and child care that worked with their schedules, whether that's in the summer when school's out, or accessible in terms of the center's location and closeness to their homes. And in the focus group of employed participants, they echoed the concerns of trying to balance work with being a parent. Participants were aware of the opportunity cost when it came to progressing in their careers, so they're, they're excited about that. We will continue to analyze and discuss these focus groups to inform our work moving forward as we examine opportunities for policy and advancement in this arena. Thank you. Gracias. I would now like to introduce Commissioner Dr. Ngozi Uswagu. A woman's health is her capital. That was what Harriet Beecher Stowe said in 1862, and it is true today. Good evening. I'm here tonight as a member of the Columbus Women's Commission and the Health Committee. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist practicing here in Central Ohio. I raised my hand to be part of this team because I wanted to work with like-minded women or people who wanted to make a difference in the lives of women. The health committee launched a little under two years ago. We spent the first year learning about the issues facing women, exploring how health issues were connected to economic security, and researching where the commission could be positioned to create policy change. Infant mortality is a key focus for Mayor Ginther and our community. Every child deserves to celebrate his or her first birthday. We have made strides as a community to decrease the number of sleep-related deaths. We can and we will do more. 
Partners such as Celebrate One have identified contraceptive access as a critical component for reducing infant mortality. The Commission is interested in reproductive health and women's access to safe and affordable care. We know that access to contraceptives, especially long-acting reversible contraceptives, is crucial to women's life planning abilities and long-term economic stability. Having the power to decide if and when to get pregnant increases young women's opportunities to be healthy, to complete their education, and have a more economically secure future. Ohio is the only state in the country with no mandated health education standards for schools. I'm going to say it again. Ohio is the only state in the country with no mandated health education standards for school. Access to comprehensive, medically accurate health education has proven to reduce unintended pregnancy and increase better health outcomes. Research shows that teens who received comprehensive health education were 50% less likely to report a pregnancy than those who received abstinence-only education. The Commission has worked with Celebrate One and education partners to influence local policy to bring comprehensive, medically accurate teen health education to Columbus City Schools students in 2019-2020 school year. In the upcoming year, we will be working to expand access to more students in local school districts. We are also aware, thank you. We are also aware of the high rate of human trafficking in our community. In Franklin County, approximately 1,200 women are arrested each year for solicitation. Over 92% are identified as victims of human trafficking, first trafficked for sex at the average age of 13 through force, fraud, or coercion. Women have, who have escaped this life of modern day slavery continue to suffer the effects of extensive trauma, sexual abuse, drug and alcohol abuse, homelessness, and poverty. The commission has, has the honor of learning from catch court Judge Herbert, and the leadership at Freedom a la Carte. These partners are providing crucial services in our community, and an amazing amount of work is happening in this space. We will spend the next six months on our learning journey, including meeting with experts, with city and nonprofit leaders, to find where the commission is uniquely poised to make an impact for our residents. Additionally, we want to thank the leadership of the city for ensuring menstrual products are free and accessible to our city's recreation center. And I'm also happy to say we have changing tables. That means men and women can change poop in the restroom. We have changing table in both men and women's restrooms. Both are wonderful steps towards increasing access and equity. We look forward to hearing from you to learn more of what we can do as a commission to improve the health of women in Central Ohio, because we know a woman's health is her capital. And I'd like to welcome back to the podium First Lady Shannon Gifford. So I have to tell you, I was sitting here fairly overwhelmed by all that this commission, this volunteer commission of women and men who have raised their hands to be on this journey. Um, so thank you again to the chairs, to all of the commissioners for the work we've done thus far and to your commitment to continuing on this journey. So let's give everybody another round of applause. Okay, so before we get into table conversations, we have one more honored guest. Uh, the mayor is here with us tonight, wants to say a couple of words. So, Mayor Ginther, the stage is yours. Good evening, and uh, what a great night here. In the city of Columbus, it might be a little gray and uh, rainy outside, but the power of this room and the incredible work 
uh, the Women's Commission is inspiring to me uh, and to this community. You know, I, I was just thinking of all of the incredible work and accomplishments that the commissioners shared with us, because I've, I've always talked about the work of the Women's Commission uh, being the, the heart and, and soul of my policy agenda. It isn't some separate uh, initiative or a particular uh, project. It is the heart and soul of our policy agenda. And so thinking about where we are today, and we're just getting started. Uh, but it, with respect to access to evidence-based health education uh, for young women in our community, wasn't happening before the work of the Women's Commission. Pay equity was not being discussed and action was not being taken in this community before the Women's Commission. And eviction reform, what a powerful statistic. And I say this has so much real life every day um, examples of how this worked. 400,000, Jillian mentioned 400,000 cases removed because of the leadership of Clerk Tyak and our judges. Judge Jaisa Page, who was an incredible member of city council and doing a great job for us on the bench, led the way to pass the retaliatory eviction code changes that were mentioned before. She texted me literally uh, just a week ago of running into a mom who was thrilled to find out that she was going to be able to seek safe and affordable shelter for her family because an eviction from decades ago were not going to hold her back and put her kids at risk. Just last week. So eviction reform would not. We have more work to do. We're still an outlier. We still have an eviction by affidavit process that put so many women, particularly women of color, at risk. And we're gonna keep working away at it with the judiciary to right that wrong for women in this community. So some of you might have joined us a, a few weeks ago at West High School at the State of the City where I shared uh, my equity agenda with the community. And there is not a better example of how the Women's Commission work is the heart and soul of our policy agenda than when we talk about the equity agenda. You know, from our diversity in our employees to inclusive availability for all city contracts, continuing to increase and grow the winner's circle for women, minority-owned companies, we also want the work of the Women's Commission reaching into workplaces throughout the city. And we've made great strides, as was mentioned, with the Columbus commitment. Uh, I'll tell you this story because I work with mayors around the country and actually was just bragging about the Columbus commitment and our work in gender and pay equity, the leadership meeting of the U.S. Conference of Mayors last week. And I had mayors from around the country asking how they could bring this work to their community. And the fact, there were many at the beginning of this work that said if you don't mandate it, people won't sign this commitment and they won't follow through. Well, think about this for a second. 260 employers have signed it. 60% of those employers are private companies. And a number of them are actually leading the workshops on what they're doing in their companies because they've been in this space for a while. Accenture, Cardinal Health, uh, Gavin Communications, Nationwide. So the private sector has stepped up and responded in ways that are impacting our neighbors every day in this community. And the public sector and on our nonprofit and higher education employers, we heard from Dr. Harrison, his leadership and commitment from Columbus State. We are so proud of the ongoing work of this commission, and I wanna thank everyone for their determination and dedication to tackling these tough issues. Uh, but we have shared a lot with you tonight, and now we're turning to the part of the program where we want to hear from you. We've introduced you to the work of the commission, you've heard from many of the commissioners, uh, but we need your voices to help inform and guide us as we move forward. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. We can't reach our full potential 
and realize the vision of becoming America's opportunity city unless we first become America's equal opportunity city. And the work of the Women's Commission just isn't important to women. It's important to families, our economy, our neighborhoods, the very heart and essence of the quality of life of this community. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you uh, for all of your commitment and partnership. I want to thank the commissioners again for all their incredible work thus far. And like I said, we're just getting started. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Ginther, for your leadership, your vision, and for your unwavering support of equity in our community. And now we want to hear from you. So tonight we're going to have conversations around our four topics. So we have gender equity in the workplace, health, um, workforce development and career pipelines, and housing and evictions. So we have tables representing each of those four areas. So you'll see the topic at your table. Um, there's a table host at your table, either one of the commissioners or a staff member from the mayor's office. They will be helping to guide the conversation and capturing your insights and themes from the conversations. Um, and just conversations don't have to stay in those four topics. We know these topics are interrelated, so it's okay to have some fluidity to the conversations tonight. If you would like to move to another table, that's totally appropriate. Um, we have a couple ground rules we're gonna go over first, but then feel free to move to a table where you feel you can most contribute. Um, so we think about, we have about 30 minutes for our conversation, and if you do some math on your table, you've got about 10 people at your table. So we think about uh, it being in conversation with one another. Um, speaking from experience, from your own stories, from your own lives, personal, professional, the, your perspectives that you bring to the table. Listen to learn. You're most likely at a table where you don't know everyone seated with you. So think about over the next 30 minutes if you can learn something new from your table mates in the conversation. The third one is noticing your own impact. Some of you may be able to talk for the full 20 minutes yourself around these topics. <laughs> And there might be some at your table who need a little more time to bring their perspective forward and some encouragement to share their idea. So please notice the impact that your sharing has on others at your table. Allow the space for everyone to participate. And then again, we're gonna be capturing themes from the conversation. The other part that we have going on is there are cards at your table. If you have questions, so after the table conversations, we're gonna move into a question and answer period. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to the commissioners that are up here tonight, please write your question on the card. We'll be collecting them over the next 30 minutes, um, but please include your contact information as well. If we're not able to get to all the questions tonight, a commissioner or a staff member will be following up with you to help um, provide answers to your questions. Um, if you're at a table where there's only two or three people, feel free to consolidate with another table around you um, to help um, with the robust conversation. So with that, we are going to turn you loose and start the conversations. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move into about the next 10, 15 minutes. I have about 10 questions that have been submitted. Um, so I will ask the uh, commissioners for your response to be about one minute in length. Um, and if there's any questions that we have additional information related to your question, we'll be following up with you after this evening. Um, so a question related to health education. Um, it states, how can we start a conversation and where about getting he comprehensive health education evidence-based curriculum into our schools? Where and how do we begin that conversation? So either Dr. Bazawashi or Shannon? Wanna? Thank you for that question. You begin locally where you are. If you're a parent at the parent-teacher meeting, talking to the principal, talking to your superintendent. That's really the way to begin, talking to other parents. I don't, I know before I started the commission, I didn't even know that we didn't have any standards. When my daughter text me with questions, I just answer. But I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, so I feel like I've answered for all her friends. But the rest <laughs> of us, 
that's the way we have to start. We have to get um, comprehensive health education to schools. I would just add to that your PTAs um, and just uh, calling out this issue of we don't have comprehensive health education in schools and so what has our school district chosen to do um, and then asking questions if, if there is an organization that is currently in your child's school system offering comprehensive health education do some research use Dr. Google and figure out <laughs> where they are and what they're, there are, are organizations in schools now, I don't want to alarm anybody, but there are organizations in schools that do have a particular bend to the type of education that they are teaching and it may or may not be evidence-based. So do your homework and ask questions and keep asking questions. And in the coming months, um, we'll be putting together a toolkit that really focuses on the school districts on how to implement a curriculum, looking at what are evidence-based curriculums out in our community. And so in a couple months, we'll have more information, so feel free to follow up with us on that information as well. Um, this one is related to housing. So Jillian talked about five eviction recommendations that were passed. What are they, or where could I find more information about those? Shelly, you may have to refresh my memory, but the five that we are looking into implementing over this year, um, one is redesigning the summons, so making it a little more legible, um, making sure that the resources that tenants facing this situation can tap into, um, looking at, well, currently we're, as the mayor said, we're looking into the affidavit issue oral arguments are scheduled to be heard, so that's an exciting step in that direction, which would then require landlords be present at when the case is heard. Currently, they can do a written affidavit in lieu of testimony. Um, so that's underway. The, no. Looking at having a social worker um, employed by the court that could support families in that moment of crisis as they are facing the eviction. Um, also working with the court to have a navigator in place to again, as you walk off on the 11th floor, if any of you have been there, it, it can be chaotic if you're not sure how to navigate your way through the process. So helping to support families in that space. And the fifth one was around um, sealing records or expunging records. So we made a first step here with our clerk of court, but I think we have some additional work that we can do in that space as well. Um, this is a health-related question. Um, will the commission focus on postpartum outcomes for African-American women and women of color? Now that you mentioned that we will take a look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're having the town hall meeting, uh, to also investigate and research and see what else you want us to look into. So we will spend time since you've mentioned that. I would just add there too, the work of Celebrate One um, and the focus on infant mortality, we know that a healthy baby only happens with a healthy mom. So taking a look at um, kind of that interpartum period between babies, proper spacing, kind of all of the things that go into making a healthy mom, um, which ultimately, um, help, you know, drives the outcome for a healthy baby. So definitely I think it is on Celebrate One's um, uh, radar and also on ours. A question related to the Columbus commitment. So my company has signed the pledge. How can I make sure they're starting to make change? So the first thing I would do is make sure that they will be sending their two attendees to the March 31st <laughs> Pay Equity Best Practices session. That's where they'll have an opportunity to learn what other companies are doing and some of the cutting edge research that the market has to bear. Um, I would also encourage you to talk to your teams as well as to your, the executive team of your organizations to ask them questions. What can you do to help it spread the message about what your company is aspiring to do. So it begins with you, and it also involves uh, taking advantage of the resources that the commission is bringing to bear. Just to add one thing, if, if your companies do have business resource groups or diversity groups, um, ask the question there. You know, in the, in the women's leadership group in your company, um, ask 
if they've signed, you can the list, the up to date list. If, is it at it's everyone's table? The table? Okay, it's at yeah. everyone's table. It's also on the website to see if your company has signed, and then following up with HR, following up in your business resource groups, and asking the question about, okay, now that we've signed, you know, where else can we press based upon the recommendations that um, that the commission and other leaders in this space are making. And the list of um, committed companies is on the table outside in the foyer, um, as well as on the website. I'll also offer, we have found that the pledge can be a conversation starter no matter what level you are in an organization. You can be a CEO and take it back to your leadership team and say, hey, I think we should sign this and consider this. You can be a frontline member of your organization take it back to your HR team, take it to your CEO and say, hey, I've heard about this in the community, what are we doing about it? So any seat that you're in, you can use the pledge as a conversation starter in your company. And the best way to start that conversation is to start by thanking your CEO for stepping up and doing it because not all CEOs have gotten to that point yet. We, our approach is to celebrate and recognize and acknowledge when companies go ahead and sign the commitment. The other thing I would just add on there, just in case we don't get any more opportunity to touch on pay equity, um, you know, I always say there's a business case for this and there's a moral case. And some people will get there because it's a moral case. Others, it's a business case and a business opportunity for, to attract and retain talent. And so even if you're not certain that your leader would sign the pledge, I think that's a way to open the conversation. Millennials, Generation Z, even my daughter who's nine is appalled at the fact that she would be paid 80, 79 cents or 80 cents on the dollar to what, you know, a, a boy in her class to work at the same lemonade stand. Because those are the types of examples I give her. But the younger generations absolutely cannot believe we're still having this conversation. And so I think it's a really good opportunity for those of you who are, who are in those generations to you know, raise the question that way, even if you're not, to Shelley's point, in leadership in a company, there is still an opportunity to open the dialogue. Mm. Good point. Thanks, Ola. So um, there are lots of companies who have signed on, as we've mentioned, and many of them, including Cardinal Health, that was Ola Snow, who just offered up her services. <laughs> HR companies are more than happy to partner with each other. That's part of what we do, is we link, link folks up together to learn. Even the big companies are still learning from the smaller companies and the smaller companies from the bigger companies, and all of it's okay. So um, those are resources that we at the Women's Commission are happy to offer. A question about engagement. So it's kind of two-part. There was one question about, I want to become a member of the Columbus Women's Commission. How do I make that happen? And along the lines, if I'm not a women's commissioner, how do I be engaged? Anyone? All right. So I can talk about um, kind of our application process. Um, and Shelly can chime in here. So um, when we launched the Women's Commission, we were very intentional about making it representative of our community. If you take a look at our commissioners, you will notice the list of commissioners, you will notice they don't look like a lot of other boards and commissions. We want there to be a you know, variety of folks represented, men and women of all different colors and generational kind of the spectrum. Um, so to that end, we have an open application process every October to December where um, <clears throat> the, the application will be on the website, you apply, then there's an executive committee that takes a look. Every year, because you can see our work is organized into voluntary working committees, we are looking for specific ex expertise based on the folks that will be rolling off of the commission. Um, uh, because there are, you know, there are terms, commission terms, and so every year certain commissioners will be rolling off and new com commissioners will be rolling in. So there's always an opportunity. If you're not on the commission and you still want to be involved in the work, there is always an opportunity to attend events like this. We also um, have working committees, as I mentioned, that if you have a specific expertise and want to be plugged into the work, we can certainly um, include you there as well. And of offering ideas. Again, like tonight, if you have other ideas, feel free to have my contact information going forward um, to reach out, and we're really open to hearing your ideas here in the community. Um, this is a question, um, I think I'll take it. Um, will there be a commission on financial education? So the importance of taking advantage of 401k, savings account, checking accounts, 
um, especially since the majority of impoverished families are run by women. Um, just about six months ago, we were selected as one of seven cities across the country to engage in financial empowerment for women. Um, so right now we are getting some technical expertise and coaching from some folks who are very steeped in this space of financial empowerment and capability. Um, so we're exploring what is the city's role. We know there's a lot of nonprofit partners who are in this space. So how can we support those partners to ensure that we're doing education that is um, um, evidence-based? and as well as how are we tracking our success and the measurement in our community. So more to come on this. We are going to roll out a roadmap of the city's responsibility in this space in May. Um, and that will kind of then be a blueprint for us to continue this work into the next year. So more to come on that space. Um, this is a health-related question. Um, there is approximately 70,000 Somalis in central Ohio. Somali women have religious restriction to attend public um, OBGYNs because of gender mix. How can the commission help Somali women have a female-only um, gynecologist? Um, can you read the, I'm sorry, can you read the question yeah. one more time? Yeah. There are approximately 70,000 Somalis in Central Ohio. Somali women have religious restriction to attend public gynecologists because of gender mix. How can the commission help Somali women have a female-only gynecologist? It isn't something that we have contemplated in terms of coming up with a list, but I think we certainly could of female gynecologists, if I'm understanding the question correctly, of female gynecologists that would be accessible um, for, for folks um, that are within their religious preferences, we could certainly do that. Oh, oh. I was like, thank you for that. <laughs> I'm, so I'm sorry. I'm going to reread this question. So okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There are approximately 70,000 Somalis in Central Ohio. Somali women have religious restriction to attend public gyms because of gender mix. Thank you. How can the commission help Somali women have a female-only gym? <laughs> That's a great question. I think that is a great question. Um, yeah. we can, that's certainly, I think, something we can, we can think about and contemplate because I think Somali women obviously aren't the only ones with different religious restrictions. And so as we know, um, we recognize this, uh, our community in Columbus in Central Ohio is very open and inclusive. And so with that, we have a lot of new Americans um, with these restrictions. So I think that's absolutely something we can, can think about moving forward, especially in the health committee. And, and to add to that, um, Ms. Ginther, uh, I know that there are some gyms, uh, I personally attend one, go to one, that they do have a restricted area specifically for women, and it is closed off, and they can exercise without any males there. So um, could definitely maybe dive in and see if maybe that's you know something that we can help. Sure. Right, okay, we have like two more questions. Um, this one, I'm kind of combining two, is around um, workforce development. Um, has there been thought of creating more hands-on events, such as women mechanics giving talks on the trade, basic knowledge to help women feel empowered in the male-dominated field? And similar, how can we drive more awareness to career paths and opportunities that aren't mainstream? No college required, background checks, construction, IT, and that space. So the commission has um, had a workforce development committee and this year in January we decided that we were going to go ahead and hone in more on the uh, career pipeline as it, as it involves the women in trades. So coming to our event on May the 19th would give you an opportunity to learn more as it relates to women in trades, being able to take on uh, learning new a new you know to go into a different field without having to go get a college degree or without having to go into debt to, to get a bachelor's or master's degree um, so those are opportunities but I do encourage you that that should be the first step uh, to try to learn more as far as the Commission is concerned because of that because we knew that we had to have a more tailored fit a more honed in fit that's why we changed the title and uh, our Commission is 
our, com our committee is uh, comprised of new members. We have new commissioners on there as well as committee members that are really uh, passionate about making sure that we learn more about that specific piece uh, so that people are more engaged in the workforce as it relates to skilled traits and, and, and so on and so forth. So some of the commissioners on our uh, committee are, um, they have backgrounds in transportation and how does it relate to uh, individuals that do want to go into those particular labor markets and those particular fields, how do they get there? You know, what, what's out there, what can we work with uh, in the community with employers that um, we could possibly find a way to triage that opportunity? Childcare is another individual that we have. Uh, we have expertise in that regard on our committee as well. So, hope that answered the question. And the last question is an individual maybe seeking some advice from any of the commissioners. How do you advise a highly educated, self-motivated, self, self <clears throat> self-starter to advance in the workplace when internal evaluations by male management may have downplayed the essence of their ability and skill sets? I can start and then I'm sure we all, we all probably A, have had that experience <laughs> or something similar and um, uh, B, probably have some advice. So the one thing I would say is, um, Regardless of what happens to you, you own you. And you own finding the opportunity for mentors and sponsors in your organization. Regardless of if that's in your direct reporting line or not. Now you have to understand the culture of your particular company and work within the culture to establish some of those relationships to help support you if your direct management line is, you're not getting that support there. But, um, do your very best to continue to own your career and your professional progression because you are entirely up to you. Um, and now I'm not suggesting to stay somewhere if, if it's a hostile work environment or whatever the case may be. Of course, I'm not suggesting that. But don't let one person stand in your way of who you know you are and what you know you're destined to be. Number one, keep a me file that documents all your contributions to the organization in quantifiable terms. <laughs> keep that information and make sure you write your performance review. Don't wait for your manager to do it. I ran into a, stati thank you, uh, to a statistic just the other day, believe it or not, that 70% of women of color are in this moment considering leaving their companies. 70%. And that, we, can't, we don't have time to unpack that tonight, but that's a message for, uh, for companies out there that 70% are considering leaving. And the answer is sometimes you do have to leave in order to advance your career. Don't burn a bridge because you might want to come back and c at a higher level. So she gave me one minute, so I was 61 <laughs> seconds probably. <laughs> If anyone has any other questions, feel free to leave them on a card on the table and we'll be sure to respond back to you. Um, so to provide some closing remarks, uh, Chair Shannon Gutter. Yeah. So thanks for sticking with us tonight. Um, I know that it's a commitment beyond a long work day on a Tuesday that's rainy outside, downtown traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your coming out to share your voice, with, uh, to first of all, to learn, um, and also to share your voice. Um, your voices are really the most important in this story. Um, and know that we remain committed to you and to this community and to the economic empowerment of women and families in our community. Thank you.